Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about the system software abstraction. Now, one of the things that we're concerned about as computer architects is how is our high-level software abstracted from our hardware? And as we've mentioned in a few of the previous videos, this is done primarily through system software, which sits between our application software and our architecture in these layers of abstraction. Now, our system software is made up of a number of different components, two of the major ones being our compilers, so things like GCC and Clang, and our operating systems, so things like Linux. But what exactly do we rely on these pieces for? So what are we relying on compilers for? Well, firstly, we rely on compilers to translate our high-level code into the low-level executables that our processor can understand. So our compilers will take high-level C++ and translate them into the instructions and eventually the machine code that can be run on our processors. But we actually rely on compilers for a number of things, right? Another major thing we rely on compilers for is optimizing our applications, right? When we're writing application software, we're typically writing this at a very high layer of abstraction, so we're not really thinking about our hardware resources. So we rely on our compilers to efficiently and effectively use all of the underlying instructions and hardware resources um, that are available to us, right? With us, without us as high-level software developers having to think about those details. Now, what exactly do we rely on operating systems for? Well, we rely on them for a great many things. So we rely on them for, say, managing our hardware resources, so doing things like memory allocation and interacting with I.O. devices. Right? It would be incredibly frustrating if every time you wrote a high-level you know, piece of application software, we had to you know, build a way to allocate memory or interact with I.O. devices. So fortunately, operating systems provide this layer of abstraction, and you know, we have a nice clean interface in which we can do both of these things. Now, another thing we rely on operating systems for is managing resource sharing and security. So, you know, we're often running multiple applications or processes at the same time. Um, so we need, so we rely on our operating systems to, you know, fairly and efficiently schedule these processes. And we also want to make sure that if we're on, say, a multi-tenant system, so we have multiple people using, say, the same processor, that we have some sort of process isolation. So you know, different users can't just, you know, read each other's data or, you know, kill each other's processes. Okay. So before we move on into how we, say, generate executables and the basic flow of that, um, we should go over some terminology. So uh, the first piece of terminology we have is this thing called a compiler driver. Now, a compiler driver is a program that coordinates and drives the creation of an executable or something like a library. Now, this is often just referred to as a compiler, right? And this entire process of generating an executable is often just, you know, in common parlance, referred to as compilation. In reality, um, you know, the process of generating an executable has a great many steps, um, some of which we're going to be looking at in later slides. Um, but really, this program that we use to, you know, generate these executables is more accurately referred to as a compiler driver, not as a compiler. So this would be something like GCC. Now, below this, we have assembly. Now, assembly is just the symbolic representation of our machine instructions. So the things kind of laid out by our instruction set architecture, or ISA. So at a high level language, you know, we can use the plus, uh, the plus sign to do addition. We can use the minus sign to do subtraction, the star uh, to do multiplication, slash to do division. Now, at the assembly level, we generally have, you know, these primitive operations and we have these specialized instruction, uh, instructions. So instead of, say, using the plus operator, we'll have, say, an add instruction. Uh, like, likewise, we'll have a mul instruction or a div instruction or maybe even a specialized, depending on the type, uh, say, an idiv instruction for integer division. Right? But it, our assembly is the symbolic representation of those uh, machine instructions. Now, below our assembly is going to be this machine code, and this is the binary representation of our instructions, right? So eventually, during this process of generating, generating our executables, our assembly, right, this symbolic representation of our instructions, gets translated into something that the processor can actually understand, which is this binary form, right, just ones and zeros, uh, the encodings of these instructions. So that's what machine code is. It's just these uh, this binary encoding of our instructions of our assembly instructions. And with that, we can talk about the basic process 
of how we actually generate executables, right? And this is specifically going to be, you know, you know how we kind of go through this process with GCC and with C++ code, though the process is very similar for other languages. Okay, so at the very start of this process, right, we have our input files, right? These will be our C++ files. And the first step that uh, generally goes on when we want to make an executable is a step called preprocessing. And this is a step where our preprocessor, right, this executable, so something like CPP, um, for, for GCC, which unfortunately has the same name as our extension here, but really stands for the C preprocessor, uh, not C++. Um, now, what this program does is it expands things like macros that we have written in our program, and it finds and inserts headers. So, you know, inside of our code, if we've said we wanted to include some file, our preprocessor will find that file and insert the text wherever we had that include statement. And after we go through this pre-processing phase, we'll have these, you know, .ii files. Now these files end up getting fed to our compiler. So this is the uh, executable that's going to translate our C++ code into our assembly. So translate our C++ into the, the symbolic representation of the instructions of our processor. And for this, we use an application like CC1 plus in the case of GCC. Now we typically don't invoke this directly. Um, we generally invoke all of these things via just GCC, that compiler driver that we were talking about. Now, after compilation, we get these dot, dot S files, which are uh, our assembly code of our program. Now, to, now, once we're there, we pass that to our assembler. And our assembler is this program uh, that's going to convert our assembly language into machine code. So it's going to uh, change our symbolic representation of these instructions into the binary one and zero encodings of these instructions that our processor can actually read and execute. And we use a, a, an assembler like AS for that uh, in the case of GCC. And after that, we get these .o files, right? This object code or object files as they're often referred to. And from there, we use a linker. So we pass all of this object code and these object fi files to our linker usually something like LD. And what the linker does is it combines all of, all of this assembled code. And from there, we have our executable, right? So that's the basic process of, you know, how we get from a piece of C++ all the way to an executable. We go through pre-processing uh, to do things like expand macros and get headers. Then our compiler, uh, like CC1+, will translate that into the low-level assembly. Then our assembler will translate that into our machine code. And then our linker will combine all of these pieces of object code into an executable, right? And then we have our executable on the other side. So that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. In the companion series, uh, Bytes of Architecture, we'll be looking at a more practical example of how we can drive these individual steps um, from the command line using something like GCC. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for today. As always, I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.